Welcome to Life with David. I'm David, and today we're continuing our bare metal adventure with the RP2040. Last time we explored two core operations, which opens the door for video output. This time we'll revisit a topic I covered in my PIO series, direct memory access, but with a bare metal emphasis. So why don't you join me as we explore bare metal RP2040 DMA operations? In the PIO Chronicles episodes eight and nine, we looked at how PIO and Direct Memory Access, or DMA, work together to free up CPU bandwidth by automating data output. I'll put links to these videos in the description below. As a reminder, DMA can read and write one word of data between one address and another every clock cycle. There are 12 independent channels, each which supervise a sequence of bus transfers. These usually transfer data between memory and peripherals or between two different memory locations. A DMA channel needs to know where to grab the data, where to put the data, and how many times to repeat the operation. There are also control attributes that are used to configure and monitor the transfer process. The first three are relatively straightforward. The last is the tricky one. Four registers need to be configured for each DMA channel. Let's examine the DMA process in more detail while referring to these registers. When a DMA transfer starts, the DMA channel reads data at an address stored in the read address pointer. The size of the data chunk, that is byte, half word, or word, is configured using the data size attribute located in bits 2 and 3 of the control register. 0, 1, or 2 in these bits directs the process to grab 8, 16, or 32 bits of data respectively. Next, the DMA channel will write the data to the address stored in the write address pointer. This is the end of one transfer of data. What happens next is where the DMA magic happens. The channel will check to see how many transfers are left to perform by checking the transfer count register. If the register is zero, then this chain's DMA transfer sequence is complete, and what happens next is controlled by the chain2 attribute located in bits 11 through 14 of the control register. If these bits point to the current chain, then the DMA process will simply stop. However, if the chain2 attribute points to a different chain, then DMA control will be transferred to that chain. If the transfer count register is not zero, then the current chain's transfer sequence will continue. Incrementing the read and write address pointers are controlled by the increment read and increment write attributes located in bits 4 and 5 of the control register. A 1 in the bit means that the address pointer will be incremented before each transfer. A 0 disables incrementing the pointer. This is done when accessing a peripheral that has its data register at a fixed address. Data can transfer at the rate of one word per clock cycle. However, often data needs to be slowed down to match the speed of the peripheral that is sending or receiving data. The transfer request attribute, located at bits 15 through 20 of the control register, sets the pacing for the DMA process. Here, different peripherals or timers can be assigned to regulate the speed of the transfer process. For instance, to allow UART0's transmit function to regulate the speed of the DMA transfer sequence, input 20 decimal or 14 hex into the transfer request attribute. To allow a timer to regulate the process, input 3b through 3e hex. For full speed transfer, input 3f hex. DMA can do a little data resequencing. If the byte swap attribute located at bit 22 of the control register is set, then the bytes in half word or full word transfers are swapped in reverse order. This is useful in converting between big and little endian. The default is for the DMA channel to throw an interrupt each time a transfer sequence is completed. This can overwhelm the NVIC, especially if there are many short block transfers. Setting the IRQ quiet attribute, located at bit 21 in the control register, will stop the DMA channel from generating an interrupt except when a null trigger is sent. While we're talking about triggers, let's discuss how a DMA transfer block is started. The default method is for the processor to first write the starting read pointer, the starting write pointer, and the number of transfers to the appropriate registers. Then the DMA configuration is written to a 
the control register, which also happens to be the trigger register. Writing to a trigger register actually starts the DMA transfer sequence. However, for multiple uses of the same DMA chain, only one of the registers, for instance the read address register, needs to be changed. Rather than having to first write the read address register and then the control register to start the DMA transfer sequence, the RP2040 offers four aliases of the trigger register. In this case, alias 3 will start the DMA transfer sequence with only one write to the read address register. This saves several clock cycles to allow rapid chaining of DMA transfer blocks. Chaining one DMA channel to another can be used to configure or reconfigure another DMA channel and then start it. This allows for a repeated operation of a channel without any input from the processor. This is useful for repeated continuous streams of data, such as video signals. To make it easier to loop through data, the attribute ring size, located at bits 6 through 9 of the control register, is used to loop through naturally aligned ring buffers. The value of this attribute is a power of 2 and indicates the size of the ring buffer. For instance, if the value is 8 decimal or 1000 binary, the ring size is 256 decimal. This means that only the least significant 8 bits of the read address will change and the block will repeat itself every 256 times. The ring select attribute, located at bit 10 of the control register, is used to select whether the ring size applies to the read or write address. If the bit is set, the write address is wrapped. If cleared, the read address is wrapped. Set the channel enable attribute, located at bit 0 of the control register, to allow the DMA channel to respond to triggers and transfer data. If the attribute is cleared, then the channel will pause the transfer process and ignore triggers. Let's try an example which will simply copy data from one block of memory to another. I'll start with the two core program I used last time and replace the two core demonstration routine with the DMA routine. This will preserve all the routines I developed earlier to initialize and troubleshoot bare metal programs without using the C, C++ SDK. Note that I'm using a TTY to USB converter as detailed in Bare Metal Adventures Chapter 3. I'll leave a link to that video in the description below. DMA, like other RP2040 peripherals such as PIO, UARTs, and the phase lock loop, must be taken out of reset before it will operate. Like I did in earlier Bare Metal videos, I'll refer to Section 2.14.3 of the RP2040 data sheet. I'll take DMA out of reset by setting bit 2 of the reset clear atomic register located at 4000F000 hex. Then I'll check to see if DMA came out of reset before moving on. Next, it's time to set up the data blocks. I'll fill the first 256 byte block of memory starting at 2001000 hex with an ascending value. The second block of memory, again 256 bytes, starting at 2002000 hex, will be filled with a value of 01. Then I'll use my dump memory command to verify the contents of both blocks 1 and 2. Next is time to configure DMA channel 0. As shown in section 2.5.2 of the RP2040 datasheet, the read address pointer register for channel 0 is located at an offset of 0 from the DMA base address of 5000000 hex. This register will be set to the beginning of the first block of data, in this case 2001000 hex. The write address pointer register for channel 0 is located at an offset of 4 bytes from the DMA base address. That register will be set to the beginning of the second block of data, or 2002000 hex. There are 256 bytes to transfer, but we will transfer the data using 32-bit words, so only 64 transfers will be needed. The number of transfers register for DMA channel 0 is located at an offset of 8 from the DMA base address. That address will be set to 40 hex, which is equivalent to 64 decimal. Note that I added print statements so that I could print out the results of each register before I triggered the DMA transfer sequence. 
The most complicated register is the DMA channel control register. There are 12 attributes that need to be specified. In conjunction with Table 124 of the RP2040 datasheet, I put together a little spreadsheet that will help generate the proper control word. I'll include a link to all the demonstration programs and the spreadsheet in the description below. In this case, we will enable channel 0 with normal priority to transfer word size chunks of data. We will increment the source address and the target address for every transfer. We won't loop on a ring size boundary, and we will perform the transfer sequence once, so we will chain back to channel 0. We are not going to paste the transfers, so we will select 3F hex for our transfer request signal. We will generate an interrupt at the end of the transfer sequence, and we will not rearrange the bytes in the word as we make the transfer. Finally, we will not generate a checksum, so we will disable this feature. The rest of the bits are either reserved or are read-only values, so we will clear them. By deconstructing the attributes into bits and then reconstructing them into nibbles, we get the hexadecimal value of the control register, this time 001F8039. The control register is also the trigger register, so when I write to the control register, I'll also start the DMA transfer sequence. Right after the DMA sequence is triggered, I'll print the number of transfers as well as the control register. I'll dump the contents of both blocks of memory again in order to verify that the transfer sequence has been completed. Finally, the program will end in a tight loop. Let's try it out. Using the developer command prompt for Visual Studio, navigate to the project folder. First type make clean to remove all the old compiled files. Then type make full to assemble and compile the project files. Open a terminal program on the host computer. I'm using PuTTY. See Bare Metal Adventures Chapter 3 for more information on how to configure the terminal program. Finally, copy final.uf2 into the Pico using the boot select button. The first block of memory, starting at 2001-0000 hex, shows the source fill pattern before the DMA transfer process. The next memory dump, starting at 2002-0000 hex, shows the before target memory block filled with 01s. Following that are the channel 0 read address, write address, and transfer count registers taken just before the DMA transfer chain is started. Note that the transfer count register shows zero. This is because that register only displays the transfer count when the DMA transfer sequence has actually been triggered. Next, we'll trigger the transfer process and then immediately print the transfer count register again. Now we can see the transfer count shows 40 hex. The last register in this sequence is the control register. By this time, the DMA transfer chain has already been completed and the register simply regurgitates the value we previously entered. The next dump is memory block 1 again, after the DMA process. This is followed by another print of the transfer count register, followed by a dump of memory block 2. You can see that memory block 2 is a perfect copy of memory block 1, demonstrating successful completion of the DMA process. This is followed by another print of the channel 0 read address, write address, transfer count, and control registers. Note how the read and write address registers have been incremented by the number of transfers. Our next demonstration, Demo 2, is the same except I will transfer the data one byte at a time instead of transferring four byte words. I'll keep the number of transfers the same at 64 decimal or 40 hex, but I will change the data size attribute to 00. zero. The resulting control register is 001F8031 hex. This time, only the first 64 bytes of data are copied into memory block 2. The DMA read and write address registers are constantly updated, so they must be refreshed each time before a duplicate DMA transfer sequence is triggered. This is not the case for the number of transfer registers. 
When a DMA transfer sequence is triggered, the last value written to the number of transfers registers will be used. The same applies to the control register. This is demonstrated by Demo 3. Here we perform the DMA process demonstrated in Demo 1, but then we do it again without inputting the number of transfers. As you can see, the results are identical. We can use this to reduce the number of operations needed to configure the DMA channel. In conjunction with the register aliases, this can be used to reduce the time between DMA transfer sequences. Please see the PIO Chronicles Episode 9 for more information on aliases. I'll put a link in the description below. Often we want to move data from a peripheral such as a UART, I2C, or PIO into or out of memory. Since these peripherals have a fixed address, we do not want to increment the associated peripheral address register. I demonstrated this in Episodes 8 and 9 of the PIO Chronicles. I'll give a simple demonstration on how we accomplish this using bare metal. In Demo 4, we will simulate reading from a peripheral and storing the results in a memory block. Here we will increment the write address but not increment the read address by clearing bit 4 and setting bit 5 of the control register. I'll transfer data a byte at a time, much like if we were using a UART. We'll make 256 transfers each time. I'll simulate the peripheral read address as 20010006 hex. After we run the program, you can see that memory block 2 has been filled with the data that was contained at that address. Demo 5 is simply the converse of Demo 4. Here we will sequentially write data from a memory block to a single address, much like sending video data from a memory to PIO as I did in the PIO Chronicles episode 12. I'll leave a link in the description below. In this case, I will set bit 4 and clear bit 5 of the control register. Again, I will transfer data one byte at a time. This time, I will only make 64 transfers, stopping at 2001003F hex. I will set the write address as 20020003 hex. After running the program, you can see that only 20020003 hex was modified. The result was the last value in the chain, 3F hex. Thanks for joining me today. This time we revisited DMA with a bare metal focus. By using assembly language, I feel I have more control of the timing and location when moving blocks of data around. This should help me if I ever revisit VGA video on the RP2040. Although there are many good implementations of video on the RP2040, I'm still interested to see if I can do it myself. So stay tuned! If you like this video, or you think someone else might, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. The more likes this video has, the more YouTube will recommend it to others. Also, please leave a comment or suggestion for things to do. I hope to do more of these videos, so please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications of new videos. Let's get together next time for another day in Life with David. See you soon!